Is aging inevitable? And if so, why? The conundrum is that there seem to be aging genes, genes that have no other purpose than to destroy us. Well, well, what gives? We thought we understood how evolution works, and we thought it was about optimizing individual fitness. Well, aging destroys individual fitness, and yet evolution seems to have preferred aging to non-aging. That's Josh Middeldorf. We talk with him about his book, Cracking the Aging Code. It's about why we age and what we can do to slow it down. Then. We explore a novel about a man who never dies. We talk with Aaron Tier about his new work of fiction, Mr. Eternity. That's all coming up on today's Writer's Voice. Thanks for joining us this hour on this station and on the web at writersvoice.net. I'm your host, Francesca Rhiannon. Josh Middeldorf is the kind of scientist who likes breaking down boundaries. He started out as a theoretical physicist, but then got interested in life extension. He was curious, why does a near-starvation diet seem to prolong life in mammals? It seemed counterintuitive. So he turned his scientific research to evolutionary biology and embarked on a quest to crack the aging code. Why do we age? Why do different species age at different rates? And is there anything we can do about how evolution programs aging into our genes? In his new book, Cracking the Aging Code, Middeldorf teamed up with co-author Dorian Sagan to tackle the conundrum. If aging is so bad for us, why is it so good for our species? Along the way, the authors demolish some popular shibboleths about aging and confront readers with the question, should we try to live forever? Or should we just make the best of our time on Earth, living as long and healthy as we can? Josh Middeldorf has worked in astrophysics, optical design, and energy conservation. He's taught statistics, physics, math, astronomy, and evolution at Harvard, Berkeley, UPenn, Bryn Mawr, and other universities. Well, Josh Middeldorf, welcome to Writer's Voice. Well, thanks for having me. I've looked forward to this interview for a long time. Tell us a little bit about how you got into the aging issue. I started reading about caloric restriction, experiments where they extended the life of uh, many kinds of animals in the lab just by feeding them less. And that didn't make any sense to me. You know, I'd been trying to feed myself just as much good food as I could to keep my life long. But animals that are starved live longer? Well, one of the things that I figured out from that is that Aging must be programmed. I mean, there's nothing that an animal can do with less food that it couldn't do with more food. So it's not trying to live a long time. And that was really the germ of this book, and it was the germ of what motivated me to switch fields and become an evolutionary biologist. Explain the conundrum, call it a conundrum, that you explore in your book. And, and that is that you say, if aging destroys our fitness, then why does evolution put up with it? The standard model of how evolution works is if there's a gene that promotes itself, then that gene does better. And if that gene destroys itself, then that gene does work. For example, a gene that uh, makes stronger muscles, well, that helps you to compete in the world, do better than your other individuals, and you're, you're likely to survive better. And so a gene for stronger muscles is a selfish gene. A gene for fertility is a gene that makes more copies of itself. And it's easy to understand how genes like that make it into the genome and stay into the genome. The conundrum is that there seem to be aging genes, genes that have no other purpose than to destroy us. And these genes come from an ancient lineage. There's no question that they're there on purpose because they've been preserved since the earliest 
eukaryotic life. In other words, since life first became complex and multicellular 500 million years ago, these same genes have been preserved that cause aging. And yet, the genes do not promote their own prospects. These genes are the opposite of selfish genes. They destroy the very vehicle that's carrying them. Well, well, what gives? We thought we understood how evolution works, and we thought it was about optimizing individual fitness. Well, aging destroys individual fitness, and yet evolution seems to have preferred aging to non-aging. So why would something like starving yourself, which seems rather self-destructive, lead to living longer? Well, that, that takes me way ahead. I think of that as a clue to well, how can it be? What is the possible advantage to aging? Actually, years after my uh, discovery of the conundrum, I discovered what I think is the solution to the conundrum, which is that aging promotes population stability. Um, if it weren't for aging, then what would kill us? Well, we'd die of starvation, or we would die of an epidemic. These forms of death take everybody at the same time. If I can find enough to eat, probably you can too. And uh, under conditions where the population is spread out, diseases are really relatively rare. It's conditions of crowding and want that create the epidemics that kill everybody at the same time. So without aging, you would have death that's very clumped up Either no one would be dying for long periods of time, the population would expand uh, explosively, and then the population comes crashing down when everybody dies at the same time. Well, you can't build an ecosystem this way. If you want a stable ecosystem, you have to have a level death rate. And that's what aging is about. The, to understand the evolutionary purpose of aging, you have to look at whole ecologies and understand that aging promotes a level death rate, which makes stable ecologies possible. You know, it has always seemed to me, uh, when I hear people who are into uh, living forever, you know, the longevity community, who say that we're going to destroy death. And when I listen to that, people talking about becoming immortal, I just get sick to my stomach because aren't there too many people already on this planet? Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, we are the top predator. We have pushed aside many other species. We're in the midst of a global extinction, the likes of which the planet Gaia has never seen before. This is the fastest and most devastating extinction in the history of life on Earth. And there's no question it's being caused by humans. One of the keys to understanding aging, something that I learned to think about uh, as I came into the evolutionary field, is that evolution works on many levels at once. And what's good for the individual isn't necessarily good for the community. Uh, this is the concept of the tragedy of the commons. Everybody does what's good for himself, uh, which is to take more and more from me, to exploit maximally the resources that are common for everybody. But the result, everyone acting in a way that's perfectly rational for the self, is a tragedy of the commons. It's a tragedy for everybody together. Um, what happens is that you eventually use up all the resources that we all depend on uh, without cooperation, without making agreements that we're going to moderate our use of resources. The tragedy of the commons is inevitable. Uh, so yes, the extension of human life is, in, is good for the individual. It's disastrous for the earth as a whole. And if we're going to go on with a life extension program, the only hope that we would have is with radical conservation techniques to um, reduce the human footprint, along with draconian birth control, I'm afraid. Uh, we, we have to limit the human population 
perhaps to what it is, perhaps even to less than what the population is at present. So your book delves into the role that aging plays in evolution, but it also puts a lot of emphasis on the different ways that aging itself works. Now, one of the things you do say is that our bodies don't wear out. I mean, I think that's the idea that that we have. You know, it certainly feels to me like my body is wearing out. What do you mean when you say our bodies don't wear out? Yes, it's a it's a common belief that um, people, animals, plants wear out the same way a knife gets dull, the same way the pipes in your house get clogged with uh, deposits and uh, they need to be replaced after a while. Well, isn't that the way our, our arteries work? They get uh, clogged with fatty deposits and that's what causes heart disease. This is, a, this is an age-old idea, but yes, it has no scientific support and it's really something that scientists agree on. This is not the meaning of aging. So how to understand that in an easy way. One way to understand it is to know that there are some animals and many plants that don't age at all. And that would be pretty hard to explain if aging were just a physical law of nature. Uh, There are trees that just grow bigger and bigger over time. There's a physical law called the second law of thermodynamics. And that says entropy must increase, uh, things wear out, randomness eventually sets in. But life has found an end run around that second law. What life does is to take in energy from the environment and dump its entropy back out as waste. Uh, That's the game that life plays, and it makes growth possible, it makes evolution possible, and there's no reason that that life, that plan couldn't go on forever and ever. Our lives are limited by some something going on inside the body and not by an inevitable physical law. And this is really something that scientists do agree on. So you talk about three evolutionary stories about aging. Why don't you tell us what those stories are? Well, there are only three uh, accepted theories of what aging is. One is that aging just doesn't matter at all. Aging is an artifact of protected environments. In the natural world, everything starves or gets eaten by a predator before it gets old enough to experience aging. So aging didn't have to evolve. uh, It's just a, a question of there's no selection pressure after a certain age. There's no motivation for anything to live a long time because in nature, nothing does live that long. And the second theory is about trade-offs. It says that the body can't do everything well. There are resources that could be used to preserve the body for the long haul, or the same resources are in competition to uh, reproduce right now, to be stronger right now, to up the level of your metabolism, to, to goose your reproductive hormones. And that these are in conflict. So there's a compromise. The body takes care of itself, but not that well. And in the long run, the body suffers from not investing enough in repair and maintenance. And and this second is the dominant theory in the evolutionary science today. And the third theory is that uh, aging is simply programmed into our genes the same way at a certain time of life we grow and then at a time we turn on our sexuality, become able to reproduce, that program continues. And we develop hormones that actually destroy us. The body is programmed uh, to grow for a while, to reproduce for a while, and then to destroy itself using, for example, inflammation, using programmed cell death the body is destroying itself with age. And that third theory is not popular, but it's the one that I'm promoting in my book. Yeah, that reminds me of, you know, when I when I gave birth to my son, I had a very strong sense that, you know, whereas before then I had the sense that I was kind of maturing, 
And then after that happened, I felt like I started to die. Not because motherhood was, was bad, but just in the way you, you just spoke about it, that I had reproduced. And in a way, my body was now beginning to switch on a different program. So uh, it, that is interesting to hear you say that. But, you know, what's also interesting is how this is not just a book about... Well, English. just uh, let, 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 me, let me drop in a, a couple of comments about that. One is that it's absolutely true as a part of aging theory that I agree with that aging can't evolve until the first reproduction and that there is no aging before the first reproduction. So what you were sensing is absolutely real. Uh, there's another part of evolutionary theory that says that there's this trade-off and the more children you have, the more you're using up your body's resources and the shorter you live. And that's absolutely wrong. It's wrong in animals. It's wrong in humans. There's no relationship between how many children you have and how long you live. Maybe there's a small positive relationship, in fact, that people with more children, especially people who have children later in life, tend to live a, a little bit longer than others. So this is another area in which evolutionary theory has just failed completely. This, this idea that evolution forces a trade-off between reproduction and long-term survival, and that's what aging is about. It, it just fails completely because there is no trade-off. People who have a lot of children don't have shorter lives. They have slightly longer lives. Sorry, that was, that, that's my interruption. Well, uh, no, I'm really glad you said that. Your book, Josh Middledorf, this, this book which you co-authored with Dorian Sagan, Cracking the Aging Code, doesn't just talk about aging. It also is a kind of sociology of science around aging, you know, and explores how scientific knowledge is in, in effect curated or even we could say censored. Um, and you refer to the fact of these three different theories and that the theory that you were going on is not the accepted one. I, I wonder if you could talk uh, about how this scientific community evolved the dominant theory of aging, why you think it evolved that, and why it resists the one that you have. Yes, this is a, a sub-theme in the book, uh, and it really comes from my own experience. When I came out with my theory of aging, I, I was so proud of it, I just broadcast it in the evolutionary community, and <laughs> I got back from them uh, a rejection in no uncertain terms. My first paper was submitted to the Journal of Theoretical Biology, JTB, and I got back, instead of a peer review, normally they'd send this out and you know three different scientists would say what they think of it. I got back a one-line peer review that said, JTB shouldn't touch this topic with a 10-foot pole. They wouldn't even consider my paper for review. So, so what goes on there? The short version is that I learned that there's a prejudice in the community in terms of the selfish gene version of evolution. This wasn't Darwin's idea, but it was a version of evolutionary theory that came to the fore in the 20th century and became really a dominant form that you can't oppose around 1960 and 1970 that says that everything in evolution happens one gene at a time, Competition is only individual versus individual, and there is no such thing as cooperation. If it looks like cooperation, it's just selfish genes trying to protect other copies of those same genes. But there is no real cooperation in nature. Cooperation is just an illusion. Now, for you and me and for your listeners, this has got to seem like it's... It's crazy. I mean, you look around and you see cooperation everywhere in nature. And yet there's this dogma that says that cooperation isn't real. Cooperation is an illusion. And in fact, it's impossible for real cooperation to evolve. And that's what I was up against when I was pushing my theory out into the evolutionary community. It's not that my theory was brand new and nobody had thought of it before. It's that uh, thinking in terms of groups was completely anathema to the way that evolutionary biologists think. Well, that's so interesting because it really is a kind of social Darwinism. 
Oh, you bet. I, I think it's very closely related. In fact, the person who came up really most responsible for what's called the new synthesis or neo-Darwinism, the person most responsible for that was R.A. Fisher, Ronald Fisher, who was born in the, I believe, the 1880s, who did his most impressive work in 1930 when he wrote a book which is still the textbook for neo-Darwinism, How Evolution Works. It's the foundation of the selfish gene theory. And he was, on the one hand, an incredible mathematical genius. He gave us really the foundation of current day statistics. On the other hand, he was a racist. He believed in eugenics. Eugenics is the idea that uh, humans have to collectively decide who should reproduce and who shouldn't, because without that, the poor people are going to reproduce and the rich people are going to uh, reproduce less. And gee, the poor people are stupider than we are and they're less fit and they're contributing less to society. And the poor people who are less fit are going to take over. This was really the motivation for Fisher's work. And half of his book is uh, the foundation of selfish gene theory, which is accepted evolutionary science today. The other half was just a political screen on eugenics, on how terrible the lower classes are and how they're destroying England. It was pure racism. So there is a historic connection, which I think continues to this day, between the idea of the selfish gene and the social Darwinist idea that uh, pure competition is really the best economic system and that those who succeed in society are those who are contributing most to society. Isn't it pretty well established that human evolution was driven by cooperation? I think so. Darwin wrote a whole book on this topic called The Descent of Man, in which he talked about uh, tribes that functioned well together being dominant over tribes that uh, cooperated less well. And yet this idea is completely at odds with the selfish gene theory, which is the mainstream of evolutionary science today. Well, Josh Middledorf, let's go back, though, to the um, mechanism of aging. Uh, you've mentioned inflammation. You also talk about telomeres and cell senescence. And you talk about apoptosis. Let's explain them. How about the telomeres first? To give some context to this, I talk about four primary ways in which the body destroys itself with age. One of them is thymic involution. The thymus is a little gland that really your immune system depends on completely, and it just gets smaller and smaller and disappears into a lump of fat as we get older. So our immune systems disappear. Another is programmed cell death. Programmed cell death is necessary to protect the body. Apoptosis, apoptosis is another way to pronounce this, is really an essential part of biology. But as we get older, it's on a hair trigger. And cells that are perfectly healthy and contributing to the body are destroying themselves. And that's what um, sarcopenia is about. That's why we, our muscles get weaker. And the third is inflammation. Inflammation is another self-protective mechanism. It's the body's first line of defense against invading microbes. But inflammation turns against the body and, again, destroys healthy tissues as we get older. Inflammation is associated with all of the diseases of old age. Alzheimer's, heart disease, and cancer are all heavily influenced by inflammation. And the fourth is telomere biology, which is what you asked about. So let's go into that more deeply. So every time a cell divides, its chromosomes get a little shorter. Well, the chromosomes are the DNA. That's the instructions for the body. How can, how can we live with the telomeres that get shorter each time the cell divides? Well, there are two ways that the body copes with this. The short-term solution 
is that the chromosome is buffered on both ends with um, telomeres. They're just repeat DNA, the same sequence over and over and over again that contains no information. And it doesn't matter for a while if you lose some of it. But eventually, you've got to rebuild the telomere. I mean, you have a lifetime worth of telomere uh, when you're born, but um, eventually the body has to have, have a way of restoring it. And that's the enzyme telomerase. Telomerase just grows a new telomere. So that repeat segment, there's a little template for creating the repeat sequence that's part of the telomerase enzyme. And it's applied over and over and over and over again until it makes the telomere full length. So the key thing here is that telomerase comes out when we are in utero. It comes out when the sperm meets the egg and it comes out in early stages of development so that an embryo has full-length telomeres. But it's all downhill after that. Telomerase is then put back in the lockbox. It doesn't ever come out again. And the telomeres just get shorter and shorter and shorter. Even during the um, embryonic development, the telomeres are getting shorter so that by the time we're born, half of our telomeres are gone. And the other half get used up during our lifetime. So this is a lot of what drives aging, is that cells are losing their telomeres. The telomeres get shorter each time cells divide during our lives. And cells with short telomeres become toxic to the body. They don't just stop working. They actually send out signals that make us old and die. So with that understanding, then, um, the la last part of the book... Um, you know, with all that you've explained about how uh, aging is an evolutionary program basically to protect the survival of our species, you go into a fair amount of detail in how we can prolong our lives, uh, what we can do to uh, prevent our telomeres from getting shorter or at least to slow that down, how we can combat inflammation. In fact, you run the web website agingadvice.org. Isn't all this kind of hypocritical? <laughs> yes. I plead guilty. Friends discovered that I'd been studying aging and people started asking, uh, well, how do you keep your body young? And for their sake, I put together this website. I compiled what I do and uh, created the website agingadvice.org. But there's no question that what's good for the individual is bad for the community in this case. And I have not completely resolved that. To mitigate the damage, I would say everybody who is an advocate for life extension has to think globally as well. If you're an advocate for life extension, you're also an advocate for draconian birth control. Really, it can't be based on, on individual choice. Much as I have libertarian tendencies and I, I just feel I don't trust the state for then I can throw them. But some social controls need to be placed on who can reproduce. Uh, just allowing everybody to have as many children as possible is not going to work. Uh, the easier part of it is technology. We just haven't even begun yet to explore the technology for recycling, for alternative energy, and we're still in the habit from the 19th century of digging up the ground and turning it into products that we throw away as if the resources were unlimited and, and as if the earth were a sink that we could just throw everything away and not pay the consequences. Well, well, there is no away. I'm giving this interview from China. I'm in China at um, National Institute for Biological Science this fall. I, I have a gig here. And really, you can see it, see the results of human crowding in China better than anywhere else in the world. Yeah, can you imagine? China has a hundred, has one and a half billion people now, despite 
the one-child policy that was uh, enforced during the 70s and 80s and 90s. And even now, there's some, some of the one-child policy remains. China would have three or four or five billion people today if it hadn't been for the one-child policy. And, and as I look around Beijing and the crowded, the crowded subways, even the parks are overcrowded, there's garbage everywhere, the pollution in Beijing is some of the worst in the world. I, what, what would this country do if uh, there were three or four times as many people? But we shouldn't pin the ecological devastation caused by humans on increased lifespan alone, or even primarily. In, in fact, life extension is just one small piece of the story. If human lifespan does not increase at all, even if human lifespan were to decrease, we would still need both a new conservation economy and radical population control measures in order to halt a global ecosystem collapse that's already well underway. Yes, and your book, Josh Middeldorf, Cracking the Aging Code, is a fascinating journey into the, all these questions. I highly recommend it to our listeners. Thank you so much for talking with us here on Writer's Voice. Well, thank you. This has been a real pleasure. Josh Middeldorf. Go to writersvoice.net for links to his blogs about aging and to read an excerpt from Cracking the Aging Code.